Touching every heart, I worship you, I worship you, you are here, healing every heart, I worship you, I worship you. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you all today. Welcome to church. Come on in, find a seat. For those of you who are here with us already, uh, why don't you stand if you're able. We'll get started with our worship today. We 
keep waiting. We waited for this day, gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire, burn our hearts with truth. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens, we want to see.
the song of ancient believers filled with God's holy fire. Come on. It's every tribe, every tongue, every nation, a love song born of a grateful choir. It's all God's children singing glory, glory. Why don't you look at your neighbor and say hello this morning? Good morning, good morning. As you can see, we got a full crowd, so if you're on the edge and there's some space in the middle, feel free to just move a little bit so that those who are, are about to be coming into the room, they'll be able to get in and find a spot. God's doing something, amen? 
Amen. Well, if you are brand new, I want to welcome you to church today. Uh, I'm the lead pastor here, Daniel, and uh, it is just so great that you would join us today. If you are brand new, I would encourage you, uh, in the front of you, there is one of these cards. This is our newcomer card. We would encourage you. We believe that we want to be a church that is connected. Even though we are growing big, we think small when it comes to community. We want to be a community that is engaged together, that is involved in each other's life and, and support one another. So feel free to make sure you fill out this form. On the back, one thing you'll notice too is that there's prayer requests. And so we, we don't want to just journey with you in the great things in life, but we want to journey with you when with the questions, with the struggles, with all of that. So make sure you fill that out and you can drop it off with the, uh, the ushers as the, um, the plate's going to be coming around shortly. Um, we've got a, a number of announcements today, so just hold tight. First one is Grief Share. Uh, we've got Grief Share coming up, which is February 6th at 7 p.m. If you haven't signed up or you're wondering what Grief Share is, you'll see it on our Facebook, on social media. But uh, essentially what Grief Share is, is if you've experienced loss in your life, loss of a loved one, uh, we understand that there's grief uh, that we experience and things that we have to journey through. And we don't want to do it by ourselves. Like I said, we're a church that does this together. And so we want to make sure that we are um, going through these, uh, this process together. So make sure uh, if that is you, if you're going through grief and you're wanting to do it with someone else, that you would register for Grief Share. Um, we've also got our membership class coming up. This is uh, if you are wanting to uh, take that next step in getting involved in our church and being a part of the church and being a member. We've got it uh, February 6th, so this Wednesday. I'm going to be uh, leading out our membership class. We're going to have some fun. We're going to have some food. And we're also going to learn a lot about the church, about the vision of the church, what we're doing here at Calvary, and what we see God doing in and through us uh, over this year and into the future. So make sure you sign up for that. You can register afterwards. If you met that nice lady, Sue, who is uh, taking attendance and and, and all that fun stuff uh, back at the door here. Make sure you can uh, sign up with her at the back, or you can email us, letting us know you're going to be there at office at uh, calvarytemplenb.org. I know there's a lot of announcements, right? We got a lot of things going on. One of my favorite ones to always do, though, this is one of my absolute favorite announcements, is we've got our baby dedication coming up. As you can see, the church likes it too. Um, we've got our baby ship, a uh, ba baby ship. We've got our baby dedication. You can see that I'm working on a few announcements all at once. We've got our uh, baby dedication coming up though, uh, February 18th. So if you've got a young child or a newborn that you would like to uh, dedicate to the Lord, as a church, we want to be in community with you. And for us, uh, baby dedication is one of those things that we want to, we not only want to see our children dedicated to the Lord and do all that God has called them to, but we want to help serve you and love on your children and help, help to see them succeed in such a powerful way. And so if this is something that it would interest you, make sure that you sign up once again at the back. You can go to the front desk where Sue was, uh, she's going to be there again as you uh, exit the doors here. You'll see her on your right-hand side. But make sure you sign up for that. It's February 18th. Uh, our next one is a very important one as well. So if you can, uh, if you can uh, just keep your attention up here. Um, if I could get Dan Kim to come up for this uh, special announcement. Dan Kim. And please bring Emma Joy. Yes. It'll be the good focus of uh, our attention. Good morning, church. How are you? This is my daughter, Emma Joy. Say hi. It's, fine. it's okay. Okay. Uh, so this, I'm up here because this, this, uh, it's that time of the year again. We're going to have our annual business meeting coming up. Uh, the date will be announced in the further weeks. But I'm up here specifically to talk about board members. Um, if you don't know, we have our board members, 
we have three positions that are going to be open, and we want to ask you guys to prayfully consider and nominate those who are members. And um, it's very important to, um, as a board member. I'm a board member myself, and I feel incredibly blessed to be a part of the board and to see how God has blessed Calvary and is doing amazing things in our church. And it's just, see, just to see the growth. So for those uh, who are going to be nominated, they have to be members. And there are some qualifications that they should um, meet. And as I read these qualifications, I'm like, oh, I guess I meet these qualifications. That's great. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay. Uh, the official membership uh, leader should be a compromise of members who are a good report and sound judgment, examples of the congregation in matter of stewardship. Oh, yeah. So you want to talk? No? Okay. Uh, sorry, what was I? Church attendance, spiritual maturity, and seeking constantly, seeking God constantly, as sanctified vessels to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So it's very important that we ask you to be prayerfully nom uh, considering nominations for people who are members. And I believe there's going to be a list of members out in the back. And there's going to be a ballot over there in the front where Sue, the lady that you met there when, she, when you come into the church, there's going to be a ballot where Sue is going to be at the front over there. So... Oh, Sue right there, back there. Hi, Sue. So, yeah. So, the names of the, wall, names of the eligible people will be on the wall, all right? Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Emma Joy. All right. And just for clarification, when uh, the requirements will also be up there for our member... Um, for nominating of the board. One thing I would say, just in regards to what uh, Dan said, is if you see those things in you as you read through the qualifications and you think, oh, that sounds like me, don't nominate yourself. <laughs> Make sure someone else nominates you. That way you'll know it's true, okay? Uh, if not, you might just be a narcissist. I don't know. Um, and those are things we don't really want as a board. So, uh, uh, no, but all jokes aside, um, just as Dan was saying, is this is, uh, we see God doing some incredible things in our church, and we want to make sure that we're prayerful as we move forward. And so that those who are elected are God-fearing, loving people who reflect Calvary and reflect Scripture well. And so we would ask that you would just prayerfully consider those nominees. Well, kids, why don't you come on up here? Come on up, all you kids. Some of you are like, finally, now that the kids are, are coming forward, I can find a seat. <laughs> Wonderful. Can I get the uh, ushers to come forward as well, too? Ushers, if you can come forward. Wonderful. Kids, are you ready for Sunday school? You feeling good about Sunday school? Guys, can I get your attention up, up front? Look at this. Isn't it amazing what God is doing in our church? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Some of the kids are like, you're welcome. Yes, it's true. Well, we're going to pray for you guys, okay, as you go to Sunday school, and we're also going to pray for our tithes and offerings. You know, it's amazing what God is doing. I'm a true believer that God inv invests in healthy things. God invests in things that will grow. And so uh, we're seeing just incredible growth. God builds his church, amen? 
And so we just want to invest in what God is doing into these little lives here so that they would grow up strong and courageous, loving the Lord and loving people. And so uh, I would encourage you, if you're brand new, uh, brand new, feel no obligation to give. But uh, if you do call Calvary home, we would ask that you would just continue to, uh, to give so that we can invest in these lives, the lives in our city, and also overseas with our missions partners. And so let's just bow our heads and pray. Father, I thank you so much for these children. Lord, they are a jewel. They're jewels on our, on our heads. They... They are a beautiful representation of, of uh, just um, children that are seeking and desiring to grow and to learn and to know you more. God, we thank you for these children. We pray that they would uh, just grow up to love you with their whole heart and, and put you first. And God, as we just give of our tithes and offerings, I pray, Father, that we would continue to just invest into your kingdom not in our own kingdom, but invest in God into what you would have us do. And so we just commit that to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, guys. I see that's my water. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, as the uh, plates are passing you, uh, I would just encourage you, uh, when you have a chance, we're going to just partake in some communion now. And so if you would just be willing to uh, get ready as we participate. lot of reasons why we come to church. Uh, some come to uh, get closer to God. Some come because maybe you're feeling a void in your life. Um, some come for community and connection. Some come because they feel like they have to. <laughs> but the main reason why we gather here, the main focal point of this gathering is because of what Jesus did. The idea that Jesus gave his life for you and I. That's why we gather here, so that we can remember together what he did on that day in Calvary when he gave his life so that you could experience joy, forgiveness of sins, so that you could be in relationship with God, a whole relationship, so that you can be cleansed, forgiven, saved, sanctified, set free from bondage and sin so that you could experience love and hope and so much more. That's why we're here, because our attention is drawn to Jesus. And so before I proceed, one thing that I would ask right now that the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians is that when we partake in communion, one of the things that the Bible says that we need to be intentional about is examining our lives, examining ourselves to make sure that we're not just taking communion for the ritual of it. 
but that there's something more to it. And so one thing I would ask is that you wouldn't be distracted. And so I would just ask you in this moment to just close your eyes and bow your heads. And knowing that you have a God who loves and adores you, that gave his life for you. Maybe there's something in your life that you need to just apologize to God for. Maybe there's something in your spirit that you just need to check before you take this. And the beautiful thing the Bible tells us is that when we bring it to God, when we ask for forgiveness, is that he forgives. So is there something in your life that maybe you just want to bring to God right now so that it's not a distraction as you participate in that, in what we're about to do? the apostle in 1 Corinthians 11 says this he says for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed he took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me would you take the bread right now? This was the body that was broken for you so that you could experience wholeness in life, that you could experience joy and a bright future. And so as we take this, remember it is for you. If you think here for a moment that that this isn't for you, you're wrong. This is for you so that you can experience wholeness. He was broken so that you wouldn't have to, so that you could experience wholeness. Let's take the bread this morning. goes on to say that in the same way after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This cup signifies his blood washed us clean. Isaiah the prophet once said, though my sin was like scarlet, he washed us white as snow. You need to know today that your sins are forgiven. That when you look to Jesus, whatever you've done, whatever has been going on, that you are forgiven and he washes you clean. That's what his blood did on Calvary. It made you right before God when you would come with faith and proclaim his death and resurrection. And so today we take the cup, remembering what Jesus did for you and I. Let's take the cup. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending your son Jesus to come to earth to live a perfect life to give his life willfully so that we wouldn't have to die for our trespasses, our sins but now we can have life and life eternal we can have hope because of what Jesus did and so we remember that sacrifice that he gave And we thank you 
Jesus, we thank you for sacrificing your life for us. We thank you for what you've done. And as a result, what you're still doing in our lives as we seek you first. In Jesus' name.
things are possible and there's no broken body you can raise no soul that you can save all things are possible Father, what we need this morning more than we need 
air, more than we need food, more than we need water, more than we need anything, Jesus, is the lifeblood that comes from the indwelling of your spirit. And so, Father, I pray that you would hear our cry this morning, that you would hear our cry this morning, that we would receive you in a mighty way, that your spirit would come and join us in this place. God, we know you're already here. Make our eyes able to see it. Make our ears able to hear it. Make our hearts able to feel it. And Jesus, we need your spirit for every moment of every day. And so, Father, you are so generous to pour that spirit out. You're so generous to be able to pour that spirit out onto us. And so, Father, I pray that we would be vessels that might receive that spirit this morning, whether it be for the first time or brand new, fresh today in a brand new way for the person who's felt it a hundred times. God, I pray that your spirit would move in the word, in the worship, in every aspect of this service this morning. Father, it is all for you. And so, God, we give you honor and we give you praise in this place. Father, you are moving and we hear you and we feel you. And so, Jesus, I pray that you would continue to do the work that you're doing in this place. And so, Father, we give it to you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Father, we thank you. We give you praise. As we're in an attitude of prayer, God says it to let you know that there's manna in this house right now. He's here to provide as you journey through your promised land. Whatever he has promised you, there's provision. There's honey. There's seed for you to plant. Do not worry. The provision is there. As I speak, follow. As I heed, hold on to it. I'm here right now. I am here to provide as you journey through. So saves the Lord. Hallelujah. What a powerful space to be in this morning, church. And we're so grateful that you're here to join us in this spot. And I just invite you to have a seat as we move forward. Thank you, Dio, for that word. It is always powerful and, and incredible when we, when we hear that anointed person, that anointed word speak from uh, his heart. And so uh, I just pray that uh, you would feel that this morning, that you would receive those words and that you'd apply them to your heart and apply them to your life and know that they were for you. Um, and, and, and we're so grateful for that. So um, amazing. I don't even know how to launch off of that. I, I think I'm just gonna. I think I'm just gonna move. Um, and so I wanted to start this morning by telling you a story about my youth. Um, and a time where I was 14 years old, um, and I made the incredibly wise decision of staying out till 4 o'clock in the morning um, without permission. Nobody knew. Um, now, I want to be clear. I wasn't a bad kid. I wasn't out doing anything nefarious. Even before I was a Christian, my friends considered me to be the prudish friend. So... I wasn't out doing anything nefarious, but, and I didn't even have a curfew. My mom never told me when I needed to be home. She trusted me. It was that we had a good relationship in that. But even I knew that um, 4 a.m. was too late. Or early? I don't really know. It was not appropriate. And so I walk home, and I get to the house, and all the lights are off. Good sign, number one. Fantastic. Walk in the door. Nobody's there to greet me. Great. I walk up the stairs, I creep quietly, nothing is louder than your feet at four in the morning when you're trying not to get caught, and I get up the stairs, my mom's door is closed, lights off, good sign number two. Walk down the hallway, get to my bedroom, and I'm just like, this is, I need you to know, this is probably the most rebellious thing I ever did as a kid, so I'm just like laying in my bed, just like reveling, like, I'm the coolest, this is so cool, I can't believe I got away with this. Now, do you think I actually got away with it, church? No. I'm in bed for probably about 10 minutes when the hallway light flicks on and I hear footsteps coming towards my room and the door creaks open. Maybe it didn't creak. Maybe I'm just dramatizing the story. But the door opened and my mom is standing there. I can't see her face. She's just silhouetted from the hallway light. And she says the scariest words of my childhood. We will talk about this in the morning. And then she shut the door, 
And she knew what she was doing. She knew I wasn't going to sleep a wink the rest of the night. So why am I telling you this story this morning? I wanted to remind you, coming out of last week, that it does not take very many words to get our meaning across. I knew I was in trouble. I don't even remember if we had the conversation the next day. I have no recollection. If we had that conversation, it was not as memorable as the emotional terrorism that my mom <laughs> imposed upon me at 4 a.m. If we did, I don't remember the story. She just knew I wasn't going to sleep a wink. And so when it comes to the power of words, we can agree that it doesn't always take a lot to get the point across. Now, Pastor Daniel spoke last week on uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16, that says, Rejoice always. And we talked about, and this is something that stuck with me this week. Don't worry, I'm not going to re-preach his message. But it's something that stuck with me this week, that we as Christians are often asked to do continuously what many are asked to do occasionally. We're constantly asked to be in these postures, in these positions. And that's really stuck with me, that we should always be joyful, that we should always be thankful, that we should be grateful in every circumstance. Not because our circumstance is always good, but because we serve a God who's good. And so I've just been praying that. I just want you to know I've been praying that over this church. I've been, I've been praying that over your families. And I pray that you've been finding your joy this week. You've been connecting with Jesus and finding that joy in proximity um, with him. And part of that today is where I want to go. Because the very next verse in 1 Thessalonians 5.17 is another example of a few powerful words that we as Christians are asked to do constantly. And so the NLT says it simply. It says, never stop praying. It's the whole verse. Never stop praying. And I think these verses go hand in hand, not just because they're one after the other, and so, of course, they go hand in hand. They're of the same thought. But I can't think of a better way to make sure that our proximity is always to Jesus, that our positioning is always to Jesus, than uh, making sure that we are never not praying, that our lives reflect this, this posture, that our attitudes reflect this and foster this. And so anybody in this room who has have had a friendship, a relationship, a work partnership, or any sort of meeting of two people, you know that communication is one of the most important parts of that relationship. Communication is key. I honestly believe that, and I can only speak for myself, but I don't think I'm the only one in the room, that 90% of the conflict, the issue, the misunderstandings that happen in my relationships, whether it be personal or professional, is caused by some kind of communication breakdown. Whether it be in unsent texts, whether it be in unclear instruction, it is some sort of uh, failure of communication that brings down. And so church, when we fail to communicate with one another, or well, or often enough, we run the risk of either not being on the same page of the person that we're in relationship with, or we just drift apart completely. And, the, uh, and it's just this cavernous void between us, and we can't get back to a place where we're able to be. And so I want to start this morning by just asking you a question. Are you known in your relationships to be a good communicator? Would your boss say that you're a good communicator? Would your spouse say that you're a good communicator? I'm not talking about your charisma. I'm not talking about your ability to, I am just mean, are you somebody who connects with the people in your life well? I know for me, if anybody in this room has ever sent me a text message, I already know I probably owe you an apology. Because I am notorious for getting your text message at a busy moment, or at a moment where I don't necessarily have the answer for you. And so I'm like, oh, let me give this some thought. And I think about it. Yeah, I can see the youth nodding at me right now. That It would hurt my feelings if I didn't know the truth of it so much. I just don't respond. I'm not always a great text backer. And so I'm grateful for the people in my life who are awesome at reaching out to me and, and making sure that our connection, that our friendship, that our relationship stays um, healthy and good. I have a friend, actually, who texts me every time he eats spaghetti to just check in on me. Now, that's, first of all, brilliant, and feel free to steal it, and that's not mine. Assign some mundane task to a friend, and whenever you do that task, just reach out to your friend. Just reach out and find them. Oh, I'm eating spaghetti. I'm going to reach out to Andrew. It's brilliant. So feel free to steal it. It's not mine, so I, I feel good about telling you that. Communication is crucial to relationship, and it's no different between man and God. 
between Christian and God, between believer and Jesus. It's no different. We have to keep those lines of communication fully and completely open. We need to make sure we're in constant prayer. And so this morning, launching off the relationship question, how is your communication with God? What's your prayer life like? Is, are, are those connections open? Are those through ways, are those conversations, things that you're having? See, the connection that we have with God is primarily enjoyed through the power of prayer. That is one of the main ways where we can be one-on-one -on -one with Jesus. We can get near to him and we can allow him to speak to us and we can be in that place with Jesus. And maybe when you hear the word prayer, your mind goes right to some of the things that are synonymous with it, right? Kneeling, folding your hands, closing your eyes, bowing your head, things like this. And, and maybe once you're, if, if we're only thinking about the postures and the customs of prayer, when you hear something like Paul say, hey, never stop praying, you're like, how am I ever supposed to find the time to do this? How am I ever supposed to do this? How am I supposed to pray all day? And it's here that we need to remember that prayer is first and foremost a, com a, a conversation. It's a, it's a communion. It's us entering into a connection with Jesus. And so the things that we probably associate with prayer are just that. They're customs. They're postures of prayer. And they're important customs and important postures. But they are not prayer itself. Prayer is not found only on our knees. Prayer is not only found with our eyes closed and our head bowed. It is a constant communication. There is significant and importance, excuse me, there's significance and importance in that relationship with Jesus, that one-on-one -on -one focus, no distraction, put your head down, turn off your phone kind of connection with Jesus. There is significance in that, and it should be part of our everyday, it should be part of our relationship with Jesus. Jesus teaches about this in Matthew 6, right? He says, go off by yourself, close the door, get away from the distractions, and pray to the Father in heaven. It's where we can meet with him one-on-one. -on -one. It's where he can rejuvenate us during difficult times. It's where we, he meets with us, shares his will, shares his heart with us. This is, these are important times. And church, the reality is this. Prayer is hard work that we normally take, or excuse me, we have a tendency to maybe take a little too lightly. Prayer is difficult work. Prayer is something that we need to practice at. Prayer is something that we need to make a priority in our life and, 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 and choose to always be in that space and choose to, to not miss the appointment. Stephen D. Morrison would say, would say that prayer is difficult because there's three arenas of the human that are being engaged through prayer. I want to share those with you today. This is what Stephen D. Morrison says. He says, in prayer, there is the understanding by which we work intelligently. There's the heart by which we labor willingly. And then there's the will by which we labor doggedly. What this means to me, church, is, is it engages our mind. We first have to understand what we're saying. We have to understand what prayer is. We have to apply it to our lives. But then the heart comes along. And if you've ever had even one significant prayer session in your life where God really, you've really felt like God has met you, you know that, man, that's, that's such a great feeling where God actually intervenes and comes into that place. But these things require our will. It requires all three together. It requires the understanding, the heart, and then it requires the will as well if we're going to make it a habit, if we're going to make it a uh, continual thing in our lives. We see in Matthew chapter 28 just the, the vital uh, nature of this where Jesus, he's gone to the Garden of Gethsemane, he's staring down the reality of the cross, and he finds himself overcome with prayer and he goes to this place with his closest friends his confidants the people who he spent uh, most of his uh, excuse me all of his ministry with he was together with them these were the closest people to him and he's overcome to the point of of, of he's, he's just like dripping sweat and the, the blood is coming it's, it's, it's this terrible moment of, of prayer where he's he's trying to intervene in his life and, and he says to his best friends he says can you wait up with me while I pray. Can you work alongside me? And so three times Jesus returns to these friends and they're fast asleep. And he says to them at one point that the spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. Prayer is hard work. And we have to labor through it. We have to make sure that we understand the importance of it. Prayer is hard work, but church prayer is powerful. We believe that every good thing begins with prayer. Every good thing continues with prayer. Everything, everything, everything is prayer. Prayer is hard work, but prayer is powerful. And that's, this is why Paul's command to never stop praying 
to live a life that prays, that, that lives a heart that prays, it's so daunting. This command is so daunting because there's always some distraction to overcome. There's always something that we need to overcome. There's always something more pressing. If you're anything like me, I sit down to pray, and all of a sudden I'm thinking of the 400 things I have to do. The distraction used to just be, when I was, when I was a little younger, the distraction just used to kind of be my own selfishness. Like, oh, I'm thinking about the TV show that I like now. I'm thinking about this. I'm thinking about that. But now, as a father, as a husband, it's like the things, that I, as a pastor, there's, there's things I have to do. And so I sit down in prayer, and all of a sudden, my to-do list starts running through my head. The things I haven't done. There's always some distraction. There's always some obstacle to work through in prayer. I would argue this morning that if prayer wasn't powerful, it might be easy. If we weren't resisting temptation, if we weren't resisting the devil, if we weren't resisting the powers and principalities of this earth, prayer might be easy to sit in your bedroom and just talk to the ceiling for a little while. But instead, what we have in our hands is this powerful, powerful tool that is resisted at every turn. And so we need to make sure that we are pushing through that. And for that, we can look to Jesus. That's the best part sometimes of, of being a believer is that so many of the things that we have to apply our lives, we can actually see in the life of Jesus Christ. Jesus was known for prayer. Jesus taught us how to pray, right? Matthew chapter 6, he gives us the Lord's Prayer. And this is the template for prayer. This is how we build the rest of our prayers around it. This is the whole thing that we do. Jesus himself would often go off alone and spend time in prayer. And in, a really, in another really short, powerful verse, Luke uh, 5.16 says that Jesus would often withdraw to the lonely places to pray. He would go off by himself. He'd be alone. And he would do this often in preparation for or regeneration from some great spiritual output, some miracle, some uh, large speaking engagement where he was meeting the crowd, where he was pressed on every side. And Jesus, you would see him escape afterwards without the crowds, even without his disciples. He would go off by himself. No one understands the labor and the power of prayer like Jesus does. We have a savior who understands. We have a friend, a king who understands. And so... Knowing this desperate need, being human himself, he knows the power of this. And so he gives us the parable of the persistent widow in Luke chapter 18, verse 1 to 8. And I just want to read that uh, together this morning. This is what the word says. One day Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. There was a judge in a certain city, he said, who neither feared God nor cared about people. A widow of that city came to him repeatedly saying, give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. The judge ignored her for a while, but finally he said to himself, I don't fear God or care about people, but this woman is driving me crazy. I'm going to see that she gets justice because she's wearing me out with her constant requests. Then the Lord says this, learn a lesson from this unjust judge. Even he rendered a just decision in the end. So don't you think that God will surely give justice to his chosen people who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly. But when the Son of Man returns, how many will he find on the earth who have faith? And so maybe at first you hear this parable, you hear this story, and maybe it hits your ears just a little bit strange at first. It's like, okay, is this parable teaching me that I need to pester God until he relents? Do I need to just keep knocking down his door? Do I just need to keep um, being in a place where I'm bothering God until he gives me what I want? And I would offer this morning that Jesus doesn't give this parable to point out the similarity between God and this unjust judge, but to... to, to uh, <clears throat> but to point out instead the profound difference between the two. See, the judge was unfair, whereas God is perfectly fair. Deuteronomy tells us that in 32. It says he is, everything he does is just and fair. Everything he does. There's not a moment of his life where, where he is not fair to us. He is completely and utterly fair. The second difference I want to discuss is that the judge had no personal interest in the widow. She was just annoying him. She was just a person, just a, just a person who came to him. Whereas God loves and cares for all of creation, 
right? For God so loved the world that he sent his son. And the Bible also tells us that nothing will separate. His love is such that it is eternal and nothing can or will ever separate us from that love. God is not indifferent to his people. God is not ambivalent of his people. He is loving of his people. He cares for his people. The judge answered the widow's cry purely out of self-interest. He just wanted a moment of peace. He just wanted to be left alone. Whereas God answers our prayers, not just for his glory, but also for our good. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that God caused everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. The judge and God are not the same. This, this parable is to point out the profound difference, not the similarity. We, we see a widow, we see a woman who had to overcome the judge's reluctance in order to receive her plea. And church, if we're honest this morning, and I hope that we can be, it can sometimes feel like that in prayer. It can sometimes feel like that in our relationship to Jesus. It can feel like we have to use our perseverance or our persistence in order to sway God. Like we have to keep knocking down his door. We have to overcome some sort of reluctance or we just have to show him that we were really serious the first time we asked. If we just show God we want this enough, he'll give us what we need. He's, would, he's holding back, he's, reluct, he's relenting, excuse me, he's reluctant to answer our prayer so that we can just show him we really want it. If we pray 77 times, he'll give us what we want. If we pray a certain amount of times, we'll show him that we're totally serious. And church, I want you to know it's not like that. I want you to know that our God is not reluctant to answer our prayers. Our God is not slow to answer our prayers in his timing, not necessarily ours. He answers, his, he answers our prayers in the way that he wants, in the timing that he wants. But why does it seem that he's so reluctant? And I want to offer this to you this morning, that maybe these times of perceived reluctance or perceived slowness or whatever it is in the spirit, maybe these times our persistence is not intended to change God's heart and God's mind, but rather our heart, our mind. Maybe he knows better what we need. Maybe he knows better what we should be praying for. Maybe he knows better what we actually want. Persistence in prayer brings a transforming element into our lives. It allows us to become more like him. It allows us to be more like him every moment of every day. It builds us into the character of God himself. And it can be, persistence can be one of the ways that God shapes our hearts so that we will care about the things the same way he does that we will care about the same things that he does, that we will value the same things he does, that we will bring ourselves under his will. If you ask me this morning, church, does God answer prayer? Absolutely, 100%. I totally believe that God answers prayer. You've seen, I've seen, it. we've seen these powerful testimonies of prayer, but John says this in 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. This is the confidence that we have in approaching God. That if we ask for anything according to his will... He hears us according to his will. According to his will. If we ask for the things that he wants for us, he hears us and he grants them. See, God wants us to see and discern his will. He wants us to be able to perceive his will. He wants us to be able to uh, act according to his will. He wants us to see and discern this will through his word. And then he wants us to pray this will into action. Not necessarily into the world, but into our own hearts. So that we might desire what he wants. So that we might be working towards his purposes. Right? It's part of the Lord's prayer. Which, again, is our prayer template. It teaches us how to pray, right? One of the first lines is, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your will come, not mine. Persistent prayer is the vehicle through which we are transformed as imperfect um, humans that into a person that seeks his will, a person that seeks his will, a person that sees his will, and ultimately desires his will. And I don't think I'm alone in saying that sometimes my will is very different than his. And sometimes I need to bring that will into alignment. See, the Bible tells us that we're workers together with God, that we are co-laborers with him. And if you've ever tried to work with a coworker who's on a different page than you, if you've ever been in a disagreement with your child or your student or your spouse about where you're at, it's difficult to move forward. Co-laborers, not one's here, one's there. It's co-laborers. 
And so this sometimes means bringing our will and agenda into alignment with his. God wants us to care about the things that he cares about. And he wants us to pray passionately about the things that he cares about. The people that he cares about. The purposes that he cares about. And so then Jesus' final words of this portion of scripture is this. He says, but when the son of man returns, how many will he find on earth who have faith? And at first, I feel like this verse feels like a shot. At first, I feel like this, this, this verse is, it can, it can hit us maybe like, maybe if you got a chip on your shoulder, you're like, what does this verse mean? What is he trying to say? In the context of this story where he is encouraging us, he's encouraging his disciples to always pray. To never stop praying, to, to be persistent in prayer. I believe what he's saying here isn't a chastisement. It's not an indictment. What it is, is it's encouragement. It's a challenge, I think. I think it's supposed to challenge our hearts and minds. I think it's supposed to maybe, well, where am I at with, with any of these things? But I believe it's an encouragement to constant watchfulness and constant prayer. Constant connection with Jesus. Constant, constant, constant. So that we are constantly allowing our will to be bent to his. And so how do we begin to foster this in our lives? How can we, if it's the first time we're interacting with this, because there might be somebody in the room today who's, who's just new to Jesus, who's new to this, and they're coming to church for the first time, and, and they don't even understand the power of prayer. And maybe there's somebody in the room who prayer has become routine. It's become kind of what you do because you know you're supposed to do it and, and it's easy to do once you come to the church setting and, and everybody's hands are raised and, and you're praying, but, but maybe it's become commonplace. So how can we become people that foster this prayer attitude of every moment of every day? And so I think the first thing that we have to do, if we're gonna become people who are uh, everyday prayers, every moment prayers, we need to recognize the need for prayer. That's where it needs to begin whether you're praying for the first time or, it's, or you're trying to get out of some kind of routine when it comes to prayer, we need to recognize that our spiritual lifeblood is this powerful tool that we have in prayer, this connection, this communication with Jesus. In his book on prayer, Timothy Keller recalls an illustration that his wife made. And I want to share that with you. It's not going to come up on the screen. I just, I just want to share it with you from the heart. This is what she said. She said, imagine you were diagnosed with such a lethal condition that the doctor told you that you would die within hours unless you took a pill every night. Would you forget? Would you not get around to it some nights? No. It would be so crucial that you would never miss. Because your life might end. In fact, the doctor tells you it would end in a matter of hours if you missed. I don't think we'd miss. I don't think we'd miss. See, prayer, here's the problem, church. Prayer often becomes a last resort rather than a first response. Prayer is something that we end up doing when we're already drowning in the water. We're not necessarily doing it as we're planning the trip, as we're buying the ticket for the boat, as we're climbing on the boat, as we're enjoying the vacation with the family. We end up praying, oh no, I'm in trouble now. Lord, can you help me? Oh no. I find myself in peril. Please help. I feel like we see that sometimes throughout Scripture, right? In some of those stories on the boat, right? Where, like, the disciples are just totally fine. They're crossing the lake. And then the storm comes. And then they're freaking out. And then they're yelling at Jesus, Don't you care that we're going to die? He knows they're not going to die. He knows the will of God. He knows the heart. Prayer cannot become a last resort for us, church. I see it all the time with some of my friends who are outside the church. They'll text me. They're going through something or it's the night before a big test or a night before a surgery or their parent got sick or something like that. And they'll text me and it's without fail. Hey, Andrew, um, you know I don't really buy into any of this stuff, but like I need all the help I can get. And so if you could throw a big word, couple words up to the big guy upstairs, I'd really appreciate it. They find themselves in trouble. Anybody else got that text? Come on. Like, I can't be the only guy in the room who's got that text from a friend who doesn't believe in Jesus. Just all the help I can get. It becomes a response to peril rather than a response of relationship. 
And I think sometimes as Christians, we have this terrible habit of, well, but it becomes less about that. It becomes more prayers become a routine. It becomes a checkbox. It becomes something that we have to do. And if you have any idea, um, and you guys love doing your chores around the house? No. When it's some, yeah, Tom loves his chores. Fantastic. Great job, Tom. Don't love my chores. When it's something I have to do, when it doesn't become something that I'm allowed to do or I get to do, it can be a slog. And church, in order to never stop praying, I need you to hear this this morning. It requires that we truly understand that our proximity to God, okay, our connection to him, our closeness to him, our remaining connected to him, it is vital to our spiritual survival. It is vital to us getting through the next day. It is vital to us accomplishing what he has called us to accomplish. We need to see it not just as a tool. Yeah, it's pretty great that we have this tool. I could do it without it, though. A tool is usually something you could do the job without. Prayer is vital to our spiritual survival. The power of prayer is vital. We need to pray about everything, church. We need to bring all petitions to him. There is no petition too big. There's no petition too small. We need to involve him in every decision, every conflict, every conversation, every celebration. Prayer shouldn't just be a call to the person who, who needs something. Lord, I need something. Sometimes it's, Lord, I celebrate you. Lord, thank you for what you've already given me. Lord, give me wisdom for this conversation I'm going to have. Lord, give me an insight into my friend's life. They're not sharing everything with me, but I can see that there's a heaviness in them. And so I want to be able to speak into their life. I want to be able to give them wisdom. Lord, help, uh, help me. Give me insight into what they're doing. I need you every moment of every day through every conversation. That is prayer. It needs to be an unmissable appointment in our calendar. And so we have to recognize the need. And the next thing I want to discuss, and again, this is not an exhaustive list. This is, this is not an exhaustive list. I don't, I, don't, I don't have time. But these are the two things that we can do in our lives to begin to, to foster this attitude in our lives. The second one is we need to recognize the diversity of prayer. If we're going to pray continuously, we can't just rely on those postures and those customs of prayer that are synonymous with prayer, the bent knees, the folded hands, the bowed heads, the closed eyes. There is significance in those times. Connect with Jesus. Please connect with Jesus. But we can, excuse me, it's crucial that we understand that we have a direct line to God at any moment of the day. We have a direct line. We are the most connected generation in history. We are Minutes away from our, from our friends at any moment. We are, we are a text away. We are a phone call away. People don't even change their phone numbers anymore when they move because there's no such thing as long distance calling anymore as long as it's in country. We are so connected. We are as connected as we've ever been. I'm actually preaching from my iPad right now that I have to put in prayer focus so that nobody can bother me. Mostly because the youth leaders used to try to prank me in the middle of preaching and they would just send a bunch of texts to the youth chat uh, when I was trying to preach. And I'm, <laughs> We are in such a way, yes, you did do that, so don't even tell me you didn't. <laughs> Not anymore. Our connection with our friends and the people in our life is such that we have to deliberately disconnect. If we want a moment of solitude, if we want a moment without our phone going off, if we want a moment without people, we need to deliberately disconnect. We need to go away. We need to turn our phones off. We need to close the door. We have to deliberately disconnect in 2024. And it's the opposite with Jesus. We have to make sure that we are deliberately making that connection. Because it's there. Every minute of every day, Jesus is with you. Jesus has got, you've got his ear. You're his most important appointment. You are there with him. Every moment of every day, a Christian should never be in a place where they could not pray because we don't have to use our voice to pray. We don't have to be in a certain place, in a certain posture, praying in a certain time. We don't have to. We could be constantly connected to him. Remember, it's about these frequent, spontaneous, short prayers all throughout the day. If we're going to bring every conversation, every conflict, every celebration, everything into the, the, the petition of God, then we have to foster these short prayer times. And it's important that you know that it does not replace your one-on-one -on -one time with Jesus. In fact, I would, I would tell you this morning that it's actually an overflow from it. 
See, the person in this room who, who, is, who prays continuously has this close-knit relationship with Jesus in the one-on-one prayer time. This one-on-one prayer closet focus, no distraction stuff. But even the most diligent prayer warrior in this room, and I know there's a bunch of you, eventually you have to leave the room. Eventually you have to go and take care of the kids. Eventually you have to go and pay the bills. Eventually you have to go and do the busyness of life. And that's where this all-the-time connection comes from. This overtime, see, all the time connection is an overflow of your personal prayer life. What happens in the distraction free prayer closet of your life? And when we acknowledge that we have a dependence on God, when we recognize that His Spirit lives within us and that we have this constant connection, and that we determine to obey Him fully, then we might find that it's natural to pray like this. And we invite Him into every moment. We invite him into every aspect, every corner of our lives. Lord, I'm going to sleep. Please wake me up in the morning. Lord, thank you for waking me up this morning. Give me good words to say. Help me to be an encouragement this morning. Father, I'm going to work, and it's, and it's, it's, it's tough out there. I'm going to school. I got an exam today. I, oh, man, I'm going through this with my family. Lord, will you just give me the strength today to, to deal with it and handle it? And then when you're in the middle of it, praying these constant spontaneous short prayers it becomes natural to pray like that as we stand in proximity with him and so I just want to close with this and I'll enjoy uh, I'll, I'll invite the band forward as we begin to um, respond over the last couple of weeks we've looked at these powerful short verses in first Thessalonians 5 we talked about rejoicing always praying always and I wanted to share something with you that caught up in my reading this week that was powerful to me. Charles Spurgeon says this about joy and prayer. He says, when joy and prayer are married, their firstborn child is gratitude. Their firstborn child is thanksgiving, it's thankfulness. And so Paul finishes this verse, these, these exhortations, these commands, he finishes it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Verse 18, he says, be thankful in all circumstances. We talked about that a little bit last week. Where do you find your joy? How do we find our joy? Is it easy to find joy in all situations? No. It's important that you know, just like we talked about last week, we're not thankful for every circumstance, but we're thankful in every circumstance. He is good no matter what's going on. And so he finishes this by saying that these things, that praying always, that rejoicing always, that always being thankful, it is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Church, it is not easy to always be joyful. It is not easy to constantly be praying. It's not easy to take the worst situation of your life and choose thanksgiving in it. But it is by the will of God that we're able to do this. The idea here that Paul's pointing out is not, hey church, it is God's will, so suck it up and do it. That's not the heart behind it, I don't believe. The heart behind these words, I think, is, church, because it is his will that you would pray always, because it is his will that you would constantly rejoice, because it is his will that you would always be thankful in every circumstance, Because he has willed it, you can do it. You have the ability to do it because he has willed it. That is his will for your life, church. So if you're here this morning and you're looking for the strength to carry on, I pray that you would persist in prayer. That you're just looking for one last gasp of hope and you're just like, I just need one thing. I just pray that you would find that in Jesus. I pray that if joy has been difficult to find lately, that you would just reach out to him and and, and accept the joy, accept the freedom that he has in you. And that if thankfulness has been really difficult lately because of whatever you're walking through, whatever you're doing, I pray that you would know that you could persist in prayer because it is his will. It is God's will. We have a God who makes the impossible possible. We have a God who, who his very name dispels demons dispels every kind of evil. We have a God whose very name heals. We have a God whose very name brings community and and, and communion. We have a God 
who wants to answer our prayers. And so this morning, church, I pray is that just as we respond to this God who has been the same through every generation, I pray that you would persist in your prayers, not give up. And so if you need prayer this morning, I pray that you would take that time. We serve a God who is here with us right now, whose hand is reaching down on his people. And there's power in reaching back. Constantly, in everything. And so let me just pray for you, and then we'll begin to respond in worship. all of those prayers. Heavenly Father, you are amazing. Thank you, God, for the way that you reach down into human history and transform us. And so, Father, over everybody in this room today, I pray that we would not feel a negative weight to this command of praying constantly, praying continually. I pray that we would feel the freedom, that we would feel free in the will of God to do this, that we would diversify our thinking in prayer and what prayer means and how we pray and the words that we use to pray. Father, give us a deep sense of our need for this, that it would be vital to our spiritual survival. Give us a deep understanding. Give us ears to hear what you're saying. Help us to see and, 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 and hear your will through our word, through our worship. Father, there are many in the room today, I'm sure, who are walking through difficult circumstances. There's many people in the room this morning who are walking through some of the best times of their life. And so, Father, both have a place in prayer. Help us to celebrate, help us to mourn, help us to petition, help us to uh, lift our friends and family up to you, Jesus, in everything that we do, every conversation, every celebration, that we would call on the name of Jesus, that we would call on the God that has been answering prayers for generation after generation after generation. And so, Father, we give it all back to you. It is you, it is yours so grateful for what you're doing in our church. Lord, we give it all back to you in Jesus' mighty name.
we would be a people of prayer, that we would be a church of prayer. You know, there, there might be some of you in the room right now or listening online, and you find yourself getting to that same spot in your faith, and you can't get past it. Or you find yourself getting into that same dead-end spot in your life, and you can't move past it. I think there's, uh, there's some real truth and power in, in the word that was spoken today about the importance of prayer and persistence in prayer. That as we seek the Lord, as we pray, and we align our lives with him, he will communicate, he will speak to you. He won't condemn you. He, don't, he doesn't condemn those who are in Christ Jesus. But what he does is he reminds you. He guides your life. And he'll help you direct you in this moment too. So I would just encourage you today, if you keep on hitting that dead end path or you keep on hitting that same spot and you can't seem to get further, I would encourage you to pray today. Spend time with the Lord and watch as he does incredible things in and through you. Amen? Amen. Let's just uh, pray quickly. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for this word. I thank you, Lord, that there's power in your word. Lord, I thank you for this truth. I pray, Lord, that, uh, Lord, as we go out today, that we would be encouraged and inspired to pray, to seek your face, to lean on you, to depend on you. Lord, that this wouldn't just be a, a habit, but, Father, that prayer would be like breath for us. It's just something we need and something we're constantly doing in the highs and lows of life. God, thank you that we have a heavenly Father who speaks to us and also loves to hear from us. There's no one like you. No one. We thank you. So we just commit this day to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, for those of you who need to go, God bless you. If you want to uh, just have someone pray for you, maybe you're going through a season, you want someone to pray, I'll be up here, as well as some of our prayer team to pray with you today. God bless.